This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Sam Mercier's. I'm Dave McDonald. And it's been a long time coming, but this week we finally have composer and new music box founding editor Frank J. O'Terry on the show. Frank, thanks for joining us. Hey, great to be here um, in, uh, in sound, if not in sight. In, in the internet. <laughs> Yes, yes. Fr- we should say Frank is Frank is, was experiencing some technical problems this morning, so we don't have f- video Frank. We just have audio Frank, and that'll 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 be enough, I think. You I know, think there's audio enough audio Frank. Frank to go around. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, full disclosure: we need to tell uh, we need to come clean with Frank about what we say uh, on the show. First of all, first off, Frank, we we call you Frankie J on the show whenever we have one of your articles. <laughs> and i don't know if that would be offensive to you so I'm, I'm trying to i'm coming clean publicly here and the other thing is we call you future friend of the show because we've been saying since the beginning we got to get that guy <laughs> so uh well well disclosure. you've done wonders for my upcoming hip-hop career so well <laughs> yes <laughs> dj frankie J on the turntables <laughs> So, right. uh, Frank, let's let's talk about some some Frank stuff instead of us stuff. Um, right. So you're as as Patrick mentioned, a founding editor of New Music Box, and that is I don't know about anybody else, but that's the first exposure that I had to to your uh, content. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how New Music Box came to be. Okay. Uh, well, it's 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 going to be 14 years ago. <laughs> it's, okay. It's a while. Um, actually, yeah, literally um, 14 years ago, Richard Kessler, who was then the executive director of an organization called the American Music Center, which actually now no longer exists, um, contacted me and asked me if I would be interested in a new venture that the American Music Center was doing which was to create a web magazine for new American music. And we had a series of talks over the summer of 1998. And by November, I was on board. And between November and May, we put together various committees and groups to talk about what this thing could be, how it could work, what the components should be, and uh, New Music Box launched on May 1st, 1999. So we actually existed in the 20th century and have, uh, there has not been a moment of the 21st century that it has not been there. So That's very Fantastic. cool. So uh, what, were, what were some of your, your goals? What prompted you to want to, to start uh, a, a web magazine about new music in, at a time when there were not a lot of those kinds of resources available. Well, I think you answered the question. Oh, I suppose, I, I suppose perhaps I did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there weren't a lot of resources available. Um, there really was, we were, we were sort of in the ghetto in terms of coverage, in terms of um, people's exposure to this music. And combined with that, I think a very important thing, you know, the internet was still a relatively new thing to the general public at that point. And an organization like the American Music Center over the years had a newsletter that went out to members. At one point, it almost looked like quasi-magazine format, but not quite. But, but it was always very low budget. So, you know, there were never the resources to do the kind of full-scale print magazine distribution, you know, do you get it into shops? Who's going to stock it in shops if people aren't buying it? Whereas the internet is this amazing thing that kind of invades people's homes 24-7, 365. Mm-hmm. All you need is a computer. You say that like it's a bad thing. No, it's a great thing. Um, <laughs> but, but, but the point is that we were able to be theoretically everywhere and anywhere with with very little resources as as you guys know at the beginning of this program you were talking about you know doing doing stuff on a low budget well here you are here we are talking from various locations all over the country and people from all over the world 
are able to look and join in with this discussion we're having on Sunday morning. In fact, it's other times of the day in other parts of the world. <laughs> and, you know, what's, what's very cool about that is, you know, we take it for granted now, but 14 years ago, everybody was kind of baffled by this. And to the point that I joined the Music Critics Association of North America at the time, and they're like, what's this internet stuff? Why don't you write you know, for real publications? At that point, this wasn't considered a, a medium that, that people did work in, did serious work in. And I would, I would think, in, in addition to, to that, it, I would think that it would have been hard to find a large enough audience to <clears throat> offset the costs of print for this, this kind of topic. No. Yeah, well, actually, you know, you, you talk the history of this thing. I mean, I, I'm reading the, the really excellent biography of Henry Cowell that Joel Sachs wrote that was just published by Oxford University Press over the summer. And, you know, Cowell started these the magazines that had articles about new music and scores of new music back in the 1920s. And Charles Ives did a lot of bankrolling of it. And he got other people to join in. But it was very low budget, and it was very hard to keep this thing afloat. And, you know, there weren't... It wasn't the kind of thing that you could buy in just any store. I mean, would that you could, right? Right. I mean, the, the idea is if you really want to reach people, a new music magazine needs to be available in Walmart. Well, it's not going to be, <laughs> at least at this point. But, you know, the Internet's better than Walmart because it's in everybody's home at this point. Right. So... You know, really, I, I want to address another part of it, though, as well. I, In addition to there not being other outlets or not a lot of very visible and viable ones in 1999 for this kind of thing, I think another very important element to New Music Box from the very beginning is we wanted to tell our own story. We didn't want... Um, I mean, this is this is a publication about new American music, created by people who are actually involved in the making of it, whether as performers, composers, um, people on the scene. You know, this is not an armchair critic who goes to a variety of different kinds of events and, oh, what's this new music thing? Oh, I don't really like that. And I think that's what we get a lot of, what we've gotten traditionally in the mainstream press when this kind of work gets covered is you have people who are covering it a lot of the times who aren't sympathetic toward it because they don't have the background in it, the exposure in it. And I, and I don't mean to say that you need to have you know a PhD in new music to understand new music. That's not it at all. But, but a basic kind of welcome attitude toward it, which is not something that the critical glance often takes toward anything. There's this idea that you know, we're going to be totally objective. We're going to be looking at this by the same standards we listen to every other kind of work. And I don't think new music has been well served by mainstream media criticism historically. So I, I think it was very important in the creation of this that it be created by people who were essentially advocates for new music because it was the field that they lived and breathed. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I absolutely. And I hear what you're saying about how new music is often covered in traditional media and, and more mainstream media. I feel like when I read a review of, uh, say, a, a, an orchestra concert that has you know Mozart and Verdi and some new piece, the the Mozart is described in detail and the performance is assessed in detail as is the Verdi. And then they get to the the new piece and it says, and then there was this new piece by this composer and they say nothing about the composer and very little about the piece except for whatever the strangest thing about the piece was. Like, yeah. <laughs> this piece, and then they did this other piece that had like, you know, people blowing across bottles or water gong like whatever the weirdest thing about the medium is is what they they fixate on yeah there's a good 20 words in there in a, in a typical music review yeah say. <laughs> well yeah. the other the other great thing uh, i'm glad you bring up the 20 words because i i almost forgot another very important thing about this is i don't mean to castigate mainstream media music critics because a lot of them have done very very good work absolutely on behalf of advocating for new music and in fact anything that reaches a broad audience and lets a broad audience know 
about what's going on in our field is good for all of us. But you, you bring up a, a very important point when you say, oh, 20 words. There are very specific word counts in print media, especially in newspapers. They need to make room this column width. They need to make room for ads, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, we don't have that problem. We can run on forever if we want to. I mean, we have another problem. For people, better or worse, who, right. Yeah, for better or worse. <laughs> um, you know, the other problem is that people online tend not to digest very, very long content. I mean, if you, if you look at stats for websites, you'll see that people tend not to stay on sites for very long. You know, we do better than most sites on that score. I can't give you exact numbers because I, <laughs> I try not to get caught up in that sort of stuff and, and yeah. commit it to memory because I think it's a, a slippery slope. But I will say that, you know, you're not pressed for a word count if you need to say a few other things. The other thing is if you, you need to explain stuff, if something's going in a mainstream publication, a print publication, you, know, you can't put it full of links so that people can figure out what you're talking about. You can't put audio to the music to show people what it sounds like. So, you know, the internet was sort of set up. We're still talking 1999 in a way, but it's carried on to, to 2012. It's the ideal medium to expose people to new music, I think. Yeah, so I think that, that was the thinking. That's great, and I'm glad that you bring up links because that's uh, that's something that we always talk about on on Sound Notion that we and I personally think is really valuable about the internet because there is so much going on in the world of of new music. There are just too many amazing musicians and amazing composers that are making great things that. If, if I'm reading an article and there's a, a, a person or a concept that I'm not familiar with that's referenced, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm an idiot, though often it does um, in my <laughs> case. But it, it there's just this thing that I don't know about. And because of the Internet and because of links and Google, I can go find that information. And, and I, we've talked about this on the show before, but one of the things that, that – we think is really important about what we do on Sound Notion is the show notes. We we have a lot of links, and I, I, I want to give Sam credit for for doing those most of the time because he does a great job not only at doing extra research uh, in in putting together the show notes, but also making them I think a pretty entertaining read. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's a, a very cool thing. And and you mentioned the the length of the articles. That's one thing that in the past we have noted about a lot of your writing in particular on New Music Box is that it's very thorough. Uh, and I I certainly, for one, I really appreciate how thorough you are. And a lot of times we will read an article that you wrote on New Music Box and think about talking about it on Sound Notion, but we often wonder what we would add to a conversation about your <laughs> your article because it was so, uh, so complete. Um, it's going to we're either going to not be able to say enough about it because it was so long and so much content or everything was already said <laughs> well i i doubt that anything is that's a, this is a compliment by the way <laughs> i i know no i know thank you and i'll take i'll take it as one um but i i do think i i feel bad that there's there's no room for discussion because i do always hope there is more discussion and i well i I, I, I think never think that everything's been said. In fact, when I when I go back to these old articles, I always want to add three more paragraphs, but there's no time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Let's, that's evident. Go ahead, Sam. I, I think it's interesting you bring up uh, the idea of of um, creating a discussion because I think that's something New Music Box does very well now. Um, basically, yes, since I the use redesign. The, just basically by using a blogging platform that allows people to comment, and I'm sure you know. Uh, the ones that I know about personally, Rob Deemer has been responsible for some geysers of blog comments related to some, anytime he makes a list. Um, <laughs> and I'm actually looking at um, New Music Box issue number seven, November 1999 on the Wayback Machine. Oh boy. And, <laughs> back in the issue days. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, but there's still, there's a forum. Even though there's not, it's like you're, you were figuring out a way to try and get interactivity in the only way you really had access to in 1999, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. From the beginning, I, I should say, uh, you know, we, we sort of glossed over the details. It's interesting. You know, from 1999, the things that have stayed is we always did these lengthy conversations um, with fascinating people 
in the new music world. You know, they were called in the first person back in 1999, as you're seeing on the Wayback Machine, and we call them cover now. But they're essentially the same thing. Our video has gotten a lot better because video has improved on the web, and you know, frankly, we've gotten much better at it as well. There were always lengthy articles in the old days. We were really sort of cute about it. We called it in the third person because you know, we had in the first person right. were the interviews, in the third person were the articles. And this thing called the forum, to be extra, extra cute and composerly, we called it in the second person. <laughs> because, you know, the second person is you, the reader. Um, and, How you know, wonderfully that, symmetrical of you. Exactly. Well, <laughs> well, to throw a monkey wrench in it, we had a fourth section, uh, which we called Him and Fuging Tune, um, which nobody understood except the handful <laughs> of people who love Henry Cowell. Um, another, another reference to the great Henry Cowell there. But I, I wanted to have four elements because we were really into this idea of New Music Box being this four-dimensional publication. And our symbol was a tesseract at the time, and that was the box. That was the new music box. Um, but, but this notion of a forum, yeah, it was very clunky, unbelievably clunky. But there were commenters from the very beginning. I think within the first week, we had commenters. And it evolved and took different forms as we kept um, redesigning the site over the years. But I agree, now it's never been easier to comment on the site. I wish, I wish even more people would do it. Um, well, I, that's, I think that speaks volumes about New Music Box in, in, in its whole life because, I mean, you can go to a New Music Box article, especially you were mentioning Rob Deemer earlier, Sam, um, and there'll be you know, dozens of comments on something like that. And you can go to any arts, uh, arts article, maybe on a, on a main publication on the Times and Wall Street Journal. There might be one or two. You know, the community simply isn't there to comment and they and it's not like comments aren't allowed aren't not allowed but i mean new music box just really engages the community so much better it's because i think a lot of it's just because it's been there so consistently for so long with with good stuff that people know that this is the place you go for that thing um i well, i was going to mention frank one of my one of my favorite pieces on new music box that i've that i've ever read is uh an interview that you did with uh milton babbitt that you with some Guilty. of those very early videos like the kind of postage stamp size videos yeah. um but it was just just one of my favorite things and it's <laughs> it sounded like you two were having so much fun and it was such a, such a delightful conversation thank you well we always we always we always try to have a good time and 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 that one i i remember we i thought it was really important to show the range of Milton's interests. Yeah, the baseball bit was great. Baseball, <laughs> beer, and uh, you know, his grilling me about turntable scratching. Oh yeah, what is <laughs> what is all the scratching of records? Yeah, you know, there was there was an, an ongoing joke that we had in the in the box, which is what we affectionately call our our work area. That uh, one of one of the people on our on our team at that point wanted to make a remix album of Babbitt stuff and have his voice over going, What is all this scratching of records in there? <laughs> I, I still think that this could be the way that, you know, total serialism can finally reach a mainstream audience. But anyway, I digress. Through through hip hop? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think that was around the time there was a Missy Elliott song that came out. I think this was Oh, I'm trying to mm, I'm going to have to look back at it, but there's a Missy Misdemeanor Elliott song that has a retrograde in the song. She actually has a phrase and it's played backwards. And I thought, "Ah, Babbitt. It was it was this <laughs> wonderful wonderful moment, but we nobody ever bothered making the Babbitt remix. It I wonder what the crossover is between Missy Elliott's music and Milton Babbitt's music. <laughs> it's probably just you, Frank. <laughs> I bet I bet they both like to I get the freak on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, who doesn't? So, <clears throat> um, I have a question. I'm looking at the uh, Wayback Machines version. First off, it, you can tell how old it is because it says, "Join the New Music Box List Serve." Yes. <laughs> Yes. Alt dot, uh, alt dot new music, right? <laughs> so this is still very, very early, and it, there's a section in the what I'm. I mean, the way it's presented, it's kind of like columns of you know the, of the different categories of things we might look at. Mm -hmm. And uh, one is called real audio, and you can listen to uh, excerpts of new CD releases. Yeah. Uh, 
and a whole bunch of like uh, real audio, I, you know, using that player samples are scattered throughout the archive. So it's not super organized yet, but already you guys were trying to get music, you know, the actual music out there for people to hear. And now if you look at newmusicbox.org, you see counter stream, re- stream radio right there. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that came about and moving towards having this uh, sort of yeah. streaming radio? Well, okay. Um, well, with the audio samples, every recording that came in to New Music Box, I guess in its first five years, we created an audio sample of. We just did it. We, we you had a you know thirty second sample, and somebody wrote an essay that referenced every single thing that came out. It eventually became so impossible, and our desks became so inundated with stuff. And I know that you've had Molly Sheridan on the show before. She's been working together with me for over a decade at this point. Um, she's really the person who kind of oversaw Counterstream and still does to this day. So I don't know what I could add to that discussion that she hasn't already told you. But um, we really wanted to have... It, it was a separate website for a while, and in the redesign, it's... In, integrated as part of New Music Box, but we really wanted to have at the American Music Center at the time this idea of a 24-7, 365 feed that no matter where you were in the world, no matter when it was, you could always be listening to a piece of new American music. That was that was kind of the idea there. Yeah, I mean, to me, uh, we're talking about 1999. I'm imagining 1999 where if yeah. I want to try and discover some new music... You know, I might schlep myself over to the the library and then go to the music library section. And then what am I going to do? Like look through the card catalog or just look at CDs and look at ones that have cool looking labels or something. You know, I mean, it's a very clunky, haphazard, random process. And to now be able to hit play right here and listen to stuff for free. And it's all, you know, cool, interesting, sometimes challenging stuff. And with all the data you need to actually learn more about it. Yeah. That's important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Frank, a couple of times you have mentioned uh, American Music Center now. Uh, yes. One, one, one has kind of grown into New Music USA. Yes. Can you talk maybe a little bit about the relationship between New Music Box and New Music USA? Sure. Well, basically, there. I I think what needs to be mentioned is that there were two organizations. Sure. There was the American Music Center, and there was Meet the Composer. And last year, we officially merged to form a new organization called New Music USA. So all of the programs that were under the umbrella of American Music Center or Meet the Composer are now under this new umbrella. It actually gets more complicated um, <laughs> because, you know, why, why make things simple, right? Um, there's a third organization called American Composers Forum, which is based in Minnesota. And all of the membership parts of what AMC did traditionally, historically, going back to 1939, membership services, um, career development workshop kind of programs, all of those things turned over to ACF. So there were three organizations. Now there are two. Uh, in terms of our relationship, um, it's, it's basically they are, they are the umbrella over us the way AMC was the umbrella over us. I work at the office of New Music USA. It's a fabulous office down in lower Manhattan, the opposite end of the borough. I'm sitting in my studio here in my apartment which is at the opposite end of the island all the way in Inwood so I get to ride the entire borough of Manhattan every day which is delightful get a lot of reading done which is why I'm able to read that 500 page cowl book um, <laughs> it's you know it's it's the office um, they they support what we do they write the checks pay the bills um, keep us going and and more importantly I think though you know now that we've merged we're in the process of really finding synchronicities between all of these programs. For years, historically, Meet the Composer has had these phenomenal, phenomenal grant-making programs that have changed the course 
of music history. If, if you look this notion of a composer in residence, the term existed before Meet the Composer was founded in 1974, but I don't think people really knew what it meant until Meet the Composer launched this amazing program, the Orchestra Residencies Program, where finally there were composers in residence at 25 major orchestras across the country. And suddenly, you know, you mentioned that review that has the one new piece. Well, before that era, there probably was no new piece to review. You know, That's maybe there, was, true. there were a couple of seasons. Um, so, you know, and they've gone on to do amazing programs with linking music and dance, composer choreography project, um, other kinds of residencies, multi-year residencies, um, and, and having composers talk this whole idea of Meet the Composer Talks where, where composers would actually show up at concerts and they would actually be remunerated for saying something about their music. You know, I, I'm, I'm one of the many thousands of beneficiaries of this over the years. I, I've gotten Meet the Composer grants to appear at premieres of pieces and talk about them and 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 you know, you know, now I can't because now we're merged and now <laughs> now, now I, I was not able to have any AMC grants. I can't have any uh, MTC grants, but it did a lot of great things for a lot of composers. And I can speak to this. You know, I'm like the guy um who can advocate for that um that hair replacement thing. I'm not only a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not only a, an advocate for it. I'm also a user of it. Uh, but it's true. I mean, it did it did so many amazing things. And now that we're all together in one office advocating for this music, I I think we're going to be. You'll see in the in the coming years, we're going to be building some really exciting bridges that will add to this history. It's it's. I think it's a very exciting time. Well, that's very cool. Um, I had another question. I just forgot it. Ah, oh, Dave, you totally blew it. I know. I'm. I I blew it as as usual. <laughs> oh, well, here. This is what I was going to ask. Um, because of your role in the new music community, and because there aren't a lot of publications like yours, I wonder if you ever feel like, um, you are w having any kind of influence on either the music that people are making or at least the way people are talking about uh, the music that they're making. Um, journalism famously described as, as the first draft of history. Um, do you ever feel like you are playing a role in, 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 in the way th our field is moving? Huh. Um, interesting. I mean, I really, as you know, if you, you read my writings, I'm very loath to put out subjective opinions about anything because I don't yes. think they ultimately carry a lot of weight. And I really try to understand everything that's out there. And so when I say, you know, do I feel I've made an impact? I like to think that New Music Box has made the impact. I would not like to put it personally back on myself because New Music Box is certainly a whole lot more than just me. It's... it's sure. Um... Uh, do we have a positive impact? I like to believe that we do. Um, do we affect the music that's being written out there? That's. Do you, um, do you think you affect, even if not the music, the way people are talking about it? Uh, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a very complex question because in a way, I wouldn't want us or anyone else to have that power. You know, I, I'm very reluctant to see anything be a dominant force that controls things. I, I like to think of New Music Box as a vessel, a conduit, that a portal. That, a platform? A platform, a portal that connects people. But I, I wouldn't want us to be shaping things. We're reflecting what's there, you know? I mean, I think that's, that's much more valuable. I think it's, it's the people who are listening and creating the music, uh, right. which you know, we are part of that community ourselves, I think it's up to all of us to form our own views of things and our own aesthetics and to create things. So, you know, on, on that level, I, I wouldn't want it to have, I, you know, I don't think anything should have that kind of power. But if it, it serves as this great connector, then that's its power. You just mentioned another one of my favorite things about yeah. New Music Box is that yeah. most of the people that are writing for it are people that are also in, in the rest of their lives making this music. 
Um, and I think that's very exciting to, to, to read about musicians and composers writing about music and composers is really, really very interesting to me. Yeah, well, that was what I was saying. You know, from the beginning, it was very important, you know, back in 1999, to have this community tell its own story rather than somebody who might be looking at this, listening to this music as, you know, it's, it's something that comes across their radar screen and it's not what they're basically focused on. I thought it was really important to have a publication that looks at this music from the inside. Right. Do you think that had anything to do with, like, I don't, I don't mean to say it like this, but just new music getting a bad rap? Um, bad rap. Well, that's a question for Frankie J, I guess. <laughs> bad rap. Um, <clears throat> Well, you, you I mean, mentioned you, I mean, it, that... so I'm going to keep running with it wherever I can. <laughs> um, let's, I mean, he's getting a bad rap. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, historically, I mean, I'm reminded, you know, I, I grew up in New York City, and there were some really, really great writers about new music who I think left a very big impact on me in my formative years. I'm thinking of people like Greg Sandow, Kyle Gann of The Village Voice. Um were writing about new music. Um, I was a little young when Tom Johnson was still the new music critic there, but I went back and looked at his stuff later. Um, Leighton Kerner, I'm mentioning all these Village Voice people because I thought they were all really, really open-minded. Um, and then there were the critics at the Times, and I, I had gotten very, very deeply interested in microtonal music. I guess at some point... In my senior year of high school, my junior or senior year of high school, I, I learned about this stuff. I met Johnny Reinhardt, who runs this American Festival of Microtonal Music, and I learned about all these composers. And I remember falling in love with this crazy Czech Moravian composer's music, Alash Haba. It was an early 20th century composer. And nobody, nobody knew who he, he was. I'm going on this long winded digression. I'm getting back. That's Trust fine. Me. <laughs> Go for um, it. And I, I bring this up because there was a review of. The Met Opera by Donald Henahan, who was the then chief critic of the New York Times, and he talked about well why not why there's there isn't much contemporary opera being done at the Met understatement back then, um, and said well it really isn't worthy of being done, and he went on this whole tirade mentioning composers, and then all of a sudden he mentioned Haba. I'm like oh my god, there's Haba's name mentioned in the New York Times. He said you know and and they could trot out one of the microtonal operas of Alash Haba, but goodness knows they already sing out of tune already, singing Verdi and, and Bizet. And I was so upset. I was so upset by this. And I thought, this guy, it was obvious to me that he'd never heard a note of Haba's operas because there were three of them. Only one of them ever got commercially recorded. And the one that, which was the one I knew, and it was a limited edition. It was a Superphone thing that wasn't really available in the U.S. And I doubt he had heard it. And, you know, you'd have these articles like this. So, you know, when you say getting a bad rap, um, I'm, I'm actually spiraling back to that. I, I think bad rap might be the wrong term. I think written from a point of view that's not sympathetic toward whether it's positive or negative, it's written mm -hmm. from a position that's maybe not informed in a way that can really tell you something. Um, David, you mentioned the review that talks about maybe the weird sound of the bottles in the new piece after all this talk about Mozart and Vivaldi. I think those were the other two composers you mentioned. Um, you know, people have heard Mozart and Vivaldi loads of times so they can form an intelligent opinion, or so they think, about it, so they feel like they can say something intelligent. People are afraid to say something about something they don't know about. I think that's part of it. Um, but I also think there's a problem with this notion of feeling the need to express definitive opinions about things. I mean, I think that's a problem, too. I think it's a problem in the way people write about Mozart and Vivaldi as well, or the new piece. You know, I, what I think about whatever piece of music there is, I think, at the end of the day, isn't really all that important. What's important is what whoever is listening to it, including me, thinks about it for him or herself, and what the composer and the performers have thought about it in making the piece and in shaping the interpretation of it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, reading reviews, I read reviews all day. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I mean, uh, there's certainly the, the I would, 
you know, expository writing, I mean, it, I, I think is present, but I mean, it changes from writer to writer, definitely. Um, and I think that this, that the voice of a certain writer still exists in all these different publications, but you're right in the sense that, you know, there is a lot of opinion going around, around and less just information. Yeah, and I think, you know, where opinion becomes valuable is when it becomes interactive. And the great thing about the web is you can have a bunch of people responding to stuff, and then it's a dialogue. Whereas if it's hard, fast prose that's an opinion that you can't talk back to, it's, it sort of you know, comes across as you know, scriptures received from on high. And I think that's, that's a, a really, really dangerous thing for getting people to shape their own ideas about artistic Things and I and I think you can't really have an engagement with artistic work unless you have your own thoughts about it, rather than take someone else's thoughts at face value. Which I guess spirals us back to you're saying, well, you know, have you affected the way people talk about new music? Uh, good heavens, I don't want them, you know, thinking the way I think about stuff. But what I would want them is having their own thoughts about it. So if they're having their own thoughts about it, I could say, well, I influence that. But that's sort of in a way, counterintuitive because it's about you having your own thoughts, not about having my thoughts. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I think you're stuck with it, though, Frank. I, I, I think <laughs> I think you're you're having an influence on what people say and what gets talked about because you are being a platform. Um, and but I mean, I, if nothing else, you're deciding what to cover. Yeah, and well, and the plus the fact that it becomes a conversation instead of just editorial text. Um, that's the big thing. You're facilitating uh, communication, and that has an influence on how people uh, perceive things because they're getting more information. So you know, you know, once again, you know, the you, the you is a plural, right? You know, we, we, we have and a, that's that. We should we should be clear about that. When I when I said you just now, I meant y y you all. We could say y'all, but it makes and well, no, y'all, <laughs> y'all, you know, y'all really should become officially part of the English language because <laughs> this, the, the plural you. Is, is really a problem. You know, in, in other languages, there's the polite you, the formal you, and the plural you. And in English, they're all the same word. It's very confusing. Um, I, so, y'all. Um, you know, from the very beginning, you know, when I came on in 1999, it was just me, and I shared a, an associate editor with the information services department. But I never looked at it as being, uh, this is what I'm doing. Because I just, I don't look at the world that way. And I think that's a bad way to look at the world. It has to be a we. Right. So I, I actually was, was just thinking, we've spent now maybe 35 minutes or so talking to Frank about uh, New Music Box. And I think that's a nice parable because I'm wondering how you manage to balance your time between... Uh, all the things that you do for New Music Box and still being a composer. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, it, it's called not sleeping a lot um, <laughs> and, and massive amounts of caffeine. Um, I, I don't I, think you're alone among composers in that. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, I just finished a new piece. Wow, it's two weeks now. Two weeks ago, I finished a new piece, although I printed it out a week ago and I made one tiny change to a vocal line yesterday. So no, it's, it's all done. Back Is to it the not drawing. done? You know, no, nope, not done. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's a new piece. It's a, it's, a, it's a significant piece. It's a 22 minute song cycle, and how I was able to create that is, it was created over six months. Every morning, I woke up at six o'clock in the morning and fired up Sibelius on my computer, and and you know would have ideas during the day, and at night would you know tickle the ivories now and again. Um, but that's how it happened, you know, carving up time, but really waking up and doing it. Um, so you're, you're a morning composer. Um, well, I'm an any time I can get time composer. Okay. And I realized at 6 a.m. I wasn't getting tons of email, although I do get some from Europe. Um, but they're easier <laughs> to ignore at 6 in the morning than they are at 8 in the morning. I wasn't getting calls. I wasn't, you know, being invited to somebody's concert, you know, and Constantly, I'm almost at concerts almost every night or every other night. So it's, it's, very, it's very tricky to find, to carve that time out. You know, the phone isn't ringing at 6 a.m. That seemed like a really good time to make music. So that was, that was a 2012 decision to do that. Before that, I was carving out time, sometimes 2 a.m. 
writing music. So, you know, this is the new paradigm. I'm now a morning composer. It worked for this piece. We'll see if it works for other pieces, and we'll see where it goes. You know, well, tell I us hope about this piece then. It. Uh, well, um, the new the new piece is a twelve song song cycle based on the poetry of Stephen Crane, who you all y'all might know <laughs> as the author of the Red Badge of Courage. Yes, and perhaps if you're adventurous readers, also is the author of a book called Maggie, A Girl of the Streets. I can't say I'm familiar. Okay. Um, But, you know, principally as a novelist, well, he also wrote poetry, and there are these really, really weird, aphoristic, somewhat otherworldly, baffling poems. And when they were first printed, they were printed all in capital letters. Um, They don't rhyme. They don't operate the way most 19th century things do. So they feel very, very, very contemporary. But contemporary in in a sense of a now that's an alternative universe now. And I like to think of what I do as something as an alternative universe now. So it seemed like the perfect text for me to play around with. And the other thing is I, I wrote them for this extraordinary singer, Philip Chia, who sings both in the baritone range and the male soprano range. And a lot of these poems are these sort of quasi-dialogues or these sort of narrator and voice things where you have, I was walking down the road and I met a man who said, you know, do this, I know the way. Well, it's clearly one voice in the poem, but it's one voice that needs two voices to get the message across. So this seemed the perfect text for him, and um, that's what this is. That's fantastic. Uh, do you ever worry when you write something like that for a person that specific that it, it, it's going to have a limited performance life? Well, you know, I mean, it's not like there are 30 orchestras clamoring to p- play my latest piece, you know? Right. Um, I write for people who <laughs> want to do my music, and I tended to write very specific pieces over the years. For years, I wrote things for myself, and then I decided that other people are much better at playing my music than I am. <laughs> and, you know, I wrote a, a saxophone quartet for Prism that I know you featured on this, on 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 your program and and thank you for that thank you for that um you know i don't know how many other saxophone quartets can navigate full 24 ultra chromatic quarter tone music but prism does and we can they, you, up. you know and they nailed it um and they recorded it and it exists you know i wrote a piece for 36 tone equal tempered rock band which three groups now have done wow. in different parts of the country um and you know that's probably a piece that could be done that's probably a more practical piece the 36 tone rock band piece ironically enough um yeah i'm not really <laughs> necessarily interested in writing the piece that everybody can play but if anybody wants a piece i'll write a piece that they'll play and you know that'll be their piece i, I think people need to own the pieces they interpret as well. I mean, I think there's an element of that. And, you know, would I turn down performances by 30 orchestras? Well, hell no. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't turn down any performances. I don't think any of us would, but I, I don't think I can worry about, well, gee, maybe there are only a handful of singers that can sing this piece. And I, and I have to tell you one more thing. Um, writing this, um, Philip Chia, who sang this, is singing this piece, premiered a song cycle that I wrote 30 years ago just last year he did parts of it in there and he's doing the full cycle at the same performance that will have the premiere of this new piece no singer has ever been able to do it because the range is so extreme so I went from no performance of a piece that is crazy and practical um, to somebody who's doing it and you know that's a good thing yeah (laughs) <laughs> you know? um, yeah, I guess, I, and I, I, I don't want to sound like one of these, you know, who cares if you listen, who cares if you perform at composers, because I'm not. I really do want people playing the music. But in terms of wanting a specific sound world, you know, I, I collect instruments from all over the world, and I've used different instruments in different pieces. And there might not be a lot of players who play that instrument, but as long as there are some, then, then there's a chance for that piece to have a life. That's a good answer. 
I can yes. I can live with that. <laughs> So, Dave, we've uh, talked a lot about New Music Box that was started in 1999. Do you know what other music, uh, online music uh, entity started around that same time? Uh, I bet you're going to tell me. Pandora Radio. Really? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem like it's been that been going that long. I guess it was very, very small at the beginning. Well, it came from the the Music Genome Project, right? It was right. It was started with just a bunch of... Like it was like it's like a bunch of undergrads from some university, right? Some music students. Well, there's a Pandora Radio Wikipedia entry, and anyone who wants to know the ins and outs of how it developed and all that stuff, they can read it themselves. But yeah, the biggest thing that I think Pandora Radio got from that is the idea of about how to categorize and genreize, I guess, music. So it's has sort of this. I don't uh, think you can do that to the English language. Yeah. How it <laughs> or the uh, French language, for that matter. <laughs> uh, so it's basically a system where you like tracks and don't like tracks, and, and it has tracks that it think sounds like the track you either liked or didn't like and makes decisions for you about what it's going to play based on that. And everybody knows how Pandora Radio works. Um, there's an interesting blog post um, by put out by Pandora. It's on the official Pandora blog. Yeah, the official Pandora blog. And uh, it's interesting. We talked about it some before we came on the air, trying to figure out exactly what this guy is getting at. The article, that, the the uh, headline that I was seeing flashing around has to do with how much Pandora is paying some of their artists. Specifically comparing it to how much Spotify is paying their artists. Right. Um, so, and, and we've all seen, there's like probably six years ago now, this um, infographic about how much, or how little I should say, Spotify pays their audience or their their musicians compared to other venues in which musicians get paid for their music and that was first of all specifically referring to independent artists this you know people that you you that you and your mother and everybody else has heard of get paid on a different uh set of standards and also was long before Spotify came to the US so it was uh extrapolating based on currency exchange from the UK, I suppose. Um, but anyway, the uh, the article in question, this Pandora blog post, I was saying kind of confused me a little bit um, because at the beginning, they talk about how proud they are to be paying all of these independent artists, how, you know, they, they rattle off three artists that you've never heard of. You've never heard of these people, but we're and paying them six hundred. figures this year or whatever. And, uh, that sounds very impressive. And they, they talk about how proud they are to be supporting these independent artists. And the rest of the article is like, we shouldn't have to pay them that much. Well, I did some more uh, looking into that, uh, Dave. Here's the deal. Um, well, I had the article open. Here it is. Uh, Sound Exchange is right, a, a nonprofit. A, yeah, well, it's an extension of. It was basically put in place by the Recording Industry Association of America by law. Yeah, and they are the people. Sound Exchange is the people who are the is the entity that collects uh, digitally based royalties. You know, for digital play. Right. Um. In 2007, Sound Exchange requested and was awarded a doubling in the per song royalty fees paid by web radio stations, <laughs> which is ridiculous. I mean, to me, it's a bald faced attempt for terrestrial radio to continue its dominance and maintain its own stuck in the dinosaur past idea of what it means to be a broadcaster. Right. Um, but then uh, in 2008, um, the U.S. Senate uh, passed a bill that allows companies like Pandora to negotiate. <laughs> so, the, the, you know, we had to convince them to let the free market take hold and do something, surprisingly. Well, well and that's what happens. That's, that's what happens with Spotify, right? That's why Spotify can pay these independent artists so little is that they're not on major record labels. And if Spotify doesn't get the, 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 the tiny record label... It's not a huge loss to Spotify, but it it could be a huge loss to the label. The large right. labels need Spotify, and Spotify needs the large labels. But for the smaller labels, the smaller labels need Spotify much more than Spotify needs them. Right. Um, so that's why that's why those royalties are so different. And we were also talking about this before the show. Um, it's it's apples and oranges to compare Pandora and Spotify. These are right. these are fundamentally different types of entities. 
um, the, the, the law classifies um, things like Pandora or as, as non-interactive streaming, essentially web radio. Although um, they changed to unlimited skips, which I didn't know. Or even the free accounts? Even uh, the free accounts have unlimited skips? Uh, it just says in 2000, December 2011, Spotify announced... Uh, oh, man. It doesn't. It doesn't clear. It, it's not okay. clear. Anyway, so, maybe. So, no. Anyway, that's that's why one of the reasons they did that was to say that no, really, you can't just pick any song because if you can pick any song, then they're negotiating individually with each label the way that Spotify does for for on demand or interactive streaming. Is this okay. something? Go ahead. Well, it's just to me, the, the the thing that he's getting at is he's he's saying, or I'm assuming it's a he since there's a picture of a guy there. He's putting forth the idea that letting Spotify pay less, something more amenable to what terrestrial radio plays in royalties, would make investment in the area grow, and investment in that area growing would make more internet radio stations, which would mean more pay going to what he refers to as middle-class musicians. So, you know, in the uh, recording industry model, you're not, there's no such thing as a middle class, obviously. There's people who are trying to strike it rich, and then there's people that have struck it rich, sort of. Right. And, th- and we've talked about this before, in that the future of media is fewer superstars and more middle, middle- class, more yeah. people that are just making a living on making whatever it is they make. And this, this is true of music. It's true of uh, video content. It's true of journalism, uh, all kinds of things, uh, software. Uh, Frank, how does, how does the, the structure work for, do you know how, how this, the, the payment structure works for stuff like Counterstream? We pay. Um, we pay, you know, we have licenses. We have licenses with ASCAP, BMI, Sound Exchange. Um, you know, I, I thought it was interesting uh, jumping in. Um, Sam, you had said something about it was great to have all this audio that you can access for free. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I want everything to be available. I, I think ideally it's great to have access to everything. But at the end of the day, there needs to be remuneration right. for people creating this stuff. And I mean, I, I think a lot of the large companies, you know, crying foul saying, oh, we don't want to pay this is, is ridiculous. And in a way, it's, it's an exact parallel to things that we see elsewhere in the world in terms of large corporations saying, oh, you know, we're, if our large corporation does well, eventually everybody will do better. Um, I'm not completely sure that's true. And I think that history hasn't proven that out. And I, I think that we're in this really weird catch-22 with internet stuff um, in a way that we never were with radio. You know, everybody listens to radio and historically, in the U.S. anyway, you can listen to radio and, and it's, it's free or perceptually free. But it's not free because radio stations have to pay royalties. Um, they have to pay ASCAP, BMI, CSAC um, for the content of the music of the, the, the people who own the rights to th- the creative work there, but not for the performance, ironically. And when you talked about the debate between terrestrial radio and internet radio, the, what the Digital Millennium Copyright Act attempted to do for the U.S. was to kind of make it, sort of tip the scales a little differently for people on the performing end of things to get remunerated for what they do. I'll give you a classic example. Um, one of my favorite recordings in the world is John Coltrane's Quintet live in Japan doing my favorite things for an hour, which is this crazy, amazing free jazz freak out. Now, mind you, there aren't a whole lot of radio stations that would play that of any kind, but let's say it was played on terrestrial radio. It's my favorite things. It's Rogers and Hammerstein, um, Richard Rogers' music, Hammerstein's lyrics, although those lyrics are not in that performance. But the way the laws are set up, the royalties go to Rogers and Hammerstein for writing the song. And if it's played on the radio, Rodgers and Hammerstein get an ASCAP royalty for it, rightfully so. 
But John Coltrane and now the John Coltrane Estate gets zero for its performance on terrestrial radio. This hour-long thing Which that really I should say is, has very little to do with anything that Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote. Exactly. Um, but, you know, they get nothing, whereas if it's played on digital radio, on internet radio, which actually, given the possibilities for niche marketing on internet radio, it's a lot more likely to get played, there will be some revenue for, for the artists involved, which I think is fair. Curiously, in Europe and other parts of the world, people pay a radio tax. You know, you have a, a tax on radio that's like a tax on everything else. You know, people use a highway. They pay a toll. People, you know, people don't like paying tolls, but how is the highway going to get fixed, you know? It's, it's one of these things where we're living in an era. It's like, oh, I want someone else to pay for it. I don't want to pay for it. You know, at the end of the day, if we don't pay for the things that we love, they're not going to be there. Yeah. I was actually just wa watching a, something on television the other day, and people were talking about how much ownership they feel about uh, Social Security and Medicare because it's itemized on your paycheck stub. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were saying that, wouldn't it be great if everything was itemized? Like, this is how much you paid for the roads. This is how much you paid yeah. for your sewers. This is how much you paid to regulate the, the radio airwaves. Like, but, you know, there are tons of people. I mean, sorry to interrupt, and you know, this will take us really on a tangent, but <laughs> there are tons of people who don't want to pay for Social Security. You know, it's kind of amazing to me. They don't want to pay for it. Well, you know, for all those people who don't want to pay for it, I'd like them to give us a call back, you know, 40 years from now when they need it. <laughs> um, you know. Or well, you just well, pay a different tax to support old people, like through I, the healthcare, you know, industry in a different way. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think it's a, it's a dangerous thing in our society where, you know, people equate freedom with not, being Not willing to pay things. for anything. Yeah. I mean, you know, things cost money. You know, I would love it if everywhere I go I had free beer and wine. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. You need to buy it. Um, you know, and I buy music. I buy books. I buy instruments. I buy, you know, when I travel, I pay for my airline tickets and my train tickets. And you know, it, it, it boggles my mind. Music is in, in this weird, weird place now where we have the ability to spread it all over the place, you know, through the internet. And as I said, you know, radio is this very interesting precedent for this because radio, what people think it's free and it's not because we have the ability to spread these things. And there are these corporations that hold things like Pandora or um, Spotify or any of these others. That doesn't mean these are free things. And I joke around with people that if somebody invented a machine, there are now these 3D replicators that apparently can replicate 3D anything. 3D printers, yes. Yeah. You know, what happens when they're able to create a simulacrum, say, of a hamburger or a simulacrum of a Budweiser or a simulacrum of a, of a Ford car? Um, so there was actually, this is interesting, there was, and this is way too far down this tangent. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember the guy who it was. Some famous uh, uh, entrepreneur just filed for a patent this last week on DRM for 3D printers for exactly that reason. Exactly. Well, the thing is, what all the folks who say, and I, and we're going to bring it off of the tangent and back to music. I am amazed how all of the folks who say, "Oh, the evil music industry. Oh, they want they want to stop the internet. They want to stop this and that." I mean, the proof of the pudding is they're not the, the, the so-called music industry that's supposedly so powerful is not powerful at all because they can't stop it. Whereas if you had a hamburger that was online, I bet you within 24 hours, McDonald's would put that server out of business. Well, I don't know about the music business not having any power. Um Relatively, in terms of the ultimate, I mean, in terms of who are the power players in the equation. And you talked, um, you know, David, you talked very astutely about how the tiny labels need this exposure more than these giant companies need them or their artists. Um, that is a reality, but it's interesting that, you know, we're kind of forced to play on their terms. Right. And to bring it back to our earlier discussion, new music box and why we created this thing yeah we remunerate everybody we we pay all our licenses we have all these licenses with everybody um you know 
the thing about the internet is you can create your own platform, but there are certain platforms that are very popular and everybody wants to glom onto them. I think that we need to be more entrepreneurial as composers, as performers, as artists, as people in the field and create our own platforms rather than give it up for something like Spotify that really has a pretty lousy deal if you look at it. Right. It is a pretty lousy deal. So we talked about that at length on the show. <laughs> may, may I propose something bold? Yes. Yeah. Skip straight to the pick of the week. <laughs> yeah, a think? bunch of stuff. A bunch of stuff happened in opera. You can. I'll put it in the show. We'll, notes. we'll go fast. The Chicago Symphony Orchestra strike is over, but they still have money issues. Who knew <laughs> that orchestras yeah. in the United States had the, problems making money? The uh, interesting thing about their problems, I thought was interesting reading the article, is if you replace musician with auto worker throughout the article, it sounds like you're. Because you're living in Michigan, you hear a lot about collective bargaining and pensions killing us and blah, blah, blah. It's exactly the same thing. James Levine is coming back. He is back to uh, the Metropolitan Opera in May the for the, the Met Opera Orchestra at Carnegie Hall. And he will conduct three, count them, three operas in the 2013-2014 season. Hey, oh, oh. Verdi's Falstaff, Mozart's Così Fan Tutte, and Berg's Wozzeck. So... Get your tickets now. Uh, the English National Opera, speaking of operas, um, puts the O in E-N-O. Did Sam, <laughs> is that you? Yeah. You wrote that? Well yeah. played. They they produced uh, an ad that uh, showed uh, Don Giovanni with the E-N-O and uh, uh, an empty condom wrapper, which has apparently caused quite a stir. Uh, the English National Opera, of course, not operating anywhere in the United States where they would definitely be, I don't know, something terrible would happen to them here. Right. Um, and there's a video that was produced advertising the production where you see different scenes of the opera and with a count of how many women uh, <clears throat> Giovanni has carnal knowledge of going by country. And, well, uh, that's, of course, the, one of the, the most famous arias from from that performance. Right. There's the ad. Yeah. That's That's the... The image from the ad. So it's uh, it's just the music going along with the account, you know, in English, <laughs> English subtitles, um, telling you what they're talking about. So that's uh, Don Giovanni getting, uh, a, I think, appropriately scandalous ads, um, <laughs> in in London media. Um, Los Angeles Philharmonic. Thank you. Los Angeles Philharmonic is ending their live theater streaming series. Um, they were not able to get enough sponsorships, despite sponsorship from Rolex. Uh, they did not have enough sponsors to support the whole series. They are still contemplating doing some uh, individual one-off events, um, but that as a series is gone. And lastly, speaking of New Music Box, you should absolutely check out Rob Deemer's uh, column this week on performers who compose let's, let's, let's carry that one over because i want let's to talk carry about it over it. okay we'll save it for next week now sam the pick of the week excellent <laughs> so our pick of the week this week as usual by our guest uh frank Oter not as usual by frank but as usual by our guest um <laughs> Is. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is the segment of the show where we feature a work each week by Frank J. O. Terry. I love um, this show. <laughs> <laughs> we're running. We've we've done eighty eight episodes, so he's going to have to get on it and compose. Yeah, we're first. running out. <laughs> um, so the 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 pick this week is a piece called Imagined Overtures, and I think you may have alluded to it earlier. Um, it was, is is this written for the Los Angeles Electric Eight? Actually, it was originally written for a band um, here in New York City called Capital M, which no longer exists. Um, and Capital M was a group that was led by a composer named Ian Moss, who had this rock band and was also one of the founding members of the composer choral collective C4. And he wanted to put together a concert of rock band music by composers and asked a bunch of people for a piece. And I, in my typical tongue-in-cheek way, said, well, you know, I would write a piece for you guys if I could write it in 36-tone equal temperament. And he kind of looked at me like, you know, you're nuts. I'm like, well, yeah, but you did ask me. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> so I did, and you know, they, they played it a couple of times at, at different clubs. It was done at Galapagos and at the Stone, not, the, not at the Stone, sorry. Um, Prism did the, the sax quartet at the Stone. It was done at... Um, Tonic, which no longer exists, 
And the cutting room was where the premiere was, and it was done by a group in Seattle when I was out there. But the Los Angeles Electric Gate guys, very interestingly, um, really chose to run with this piece. And I met one of the members of the group, Ben Harbert, who's the founder when I was in L.A. for an ASCAP uh, I Create Music Expo some years back. And I, I just I was talking about this piece. Oh, I'd love to hear it, love to hear it. I got him a score and recording. And the next thing I knew, they were playing it in L.A. They were playing it in California. They recorded it. And the interesting thing about this piece is it's it's three electric guitars, each tuned to sixth of a tone away from each other. So you've got one at A440, one at A448, and one at A432. Um, the bass is scortatura, and you have drums. But the L.A. Electric 8, since there are eight guys, um, eight you know, men and women, uh, eight people, um, Guys is another one of those words like y'all, right? You know, yeah. Kind of, eight gender you know, neutral right? entities. Eight, uh, gender neutral word. Um, eight members of the LA Electric Eight, so they had to double up. So there are six electric guitars, two basses, but just the one drummer who's a guest who they bring on for this. And they're doing a tour of the piece this year. And I talked to them about the possibility of, you know, maybe to have better symmetry, have two drummers and do it Grateful Dead style. So I'm really curious to hear what would happen with that. But. But they sort of, it wasn't written for them, but they've kind of run with it. So I feel like it's their piece at this point. That's well, my long-winded answer. I think you should suggest to them that you write them some more pieces to go with those pieces. Well, yeah. Well, well, you know, now that there are eight guitars, heavens, you know, I mean, I could divide well, the octave the even further. I mean, this could be really, really interesting, right? Well, it's it's not an intensely complicated uh, like tuning setup, you know. I mean, like you just you know what your numbers are, and you plug in an electric tuner and you hit them. Exactly. But it seems a shame to uh, to have that elaborate of a setup and not use it more because these are all like a couple minutes long, right? These pieces. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'd like to see like six more of these. <laughs> <laughs> well, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., I will, I will yeah. give you a thought. Um, now, Sam said. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should maybe listen to a little bit of this. Um, we didn't we didn't talk about before which, which ones we were going to play. Sam, you said you kind of liked the third one. I kind of liked the second one. Frank, do you have a favorite? Oh, God. Well, I mean, they're all very different from each yes. other. I mean, maybe maybe Sam, can you sample all three of them sure. to give people the idea? Of sure. I mean, the first one is sort of this kind of, you know, new wave kind of Cars-like thing, whereas the second movement is sort of prog rock, and the third is this doom sonic youth kind of um, post-no wave. So, that, so the, that, that I liked the second and Sam likes the third tells you everything you need to know about me and Sam. Um, <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll just go through these and play, play, play a, a half a minute or a minute of, uh, of each of them. So uh, the, the, I'll do them in order. This, the, the first one is natural selection. The second is intelligent design, and the third is exquisite panic.
All right. So those were uh, that was a few excerpts from Frank J. O'Terry's piece, Imagined Overtures, uh, and we will have links to where you can get the rest of those. And I would highly encourage you to do indeed get the rest of those because they're very, very cool. Thank you for sharing those with us, Frank. Oh, I cannot hear you because I've turned down the Skype. <laughs> Sorry. Uh-oh. <laughs> I, Uh-oh. You're back up. Uh-huh. Well, thank I, I, you. Yeah. I potted down <laughs> Skype while, while we were listening to the music. That's my fault. <laughs> oh, no, that's good. That's good. That third movement ends with a really cool, uh, you know, like uh, Fantasia on feedback kind of thing. That's yeah, cool. that was their idea. They they just kind of let it rip, and they're like, well, I don't know what you're going to think about what we what we did with this. And they were asking me, and I listened to them, I'm like, sounds great. Go for it. <laughs> that's very well, actually, cool. That, that answers so did the you question. actually write it in? It, sorry? No, that's just theirs. Asking, no, it's, 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 no, it's not. It's not in the score. It's... It, but, you know, it's kind of a natural, I mean, these pieces really are meant to be like rock band pieces. And most of the times the pieces were played, they were not done in concert halls. They were done in clubs really, really loud. Yeah. They, so so the, you're saying they didn't have like music stands and a conductor? <laughs> um, the, well, actually, I mean, it's all, the, the guitar parts are all very, I mean, there's a lot of meticulous notation. That second movement that you like so much, in fact, at one point has a full-on 36-tone row. Um, no, it's it, it would be very hard to memorize that. Um, they do have music stands. Okay, okay, <laughs> that's good enough. You can still rock with music stands. Yeah, yeah. well, they did. <laughs> I, they, they totally did. <laughs> they clearly they did. did. Hey, Dave, are you still looking at those files? Uh, uh, I could. I would play just the first chord of the third movement. I want to point something out here. Okay. okay. Uh, let me give that audio back. It's been a hard day's night. <laughs> when I heard that, I'm like, oh, I mean, like it cued my Beatles response immediately when I heard that. Um, so, uh, well, well, I wonder, I, wonder, I don't think I, they were dividing they were, the octave yeah. into nine equal parts. But, they uh, weren't. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, the, the third movement is the one that, that, like, I could imagine hearing Sonic Youth play that on stage, as is, you know. Um, so, would. and it's <laughs> the reunion re- tour. Uh, right. So it's g- the grindiest in a way, but it it's also like seems like the most like something you might actually hear out of a rock band for some reason to me. Well, I mean, well, it depends on what the rock band rock. is. You know that, you know, that, that second, second one. I imagine if King Crimson, King Crimson decided to retune their guitars into thirty six equal, that could work for them. Yeah. It's it's cool that you bring up Ken Crimson actually because I was looking at the picture of the is it the what's the name of the ensemble um, Los Angeles Los Electric Gate yeah Electric Gate if I am not mistaken they have a Chapman stick player oh uh, yeah <laughs> which <laughs> anyone who's not familiar with what a Chapman stick is it's a uh, sort of like make making a specially built guitar that's only for tapping so it's this huge thing where you tap on it with both hands and it's cool King Crimson actually well I don't know if they still do but they have have used a stick player in the past. Yeah, that guy in the middle that looks like he's wearing something. This guy? This guy? Yeah. But actually, I don't know if they're still manufactured this way, but they have like a clip, so you can slide the clip into your belt, and it sort of just holds it in the front of your body, and you put it up here, you know, and think of it more like a harp kind of thing. So it's really interesting to me, Frank, that Frank, you're giving so giving much liberty, liberty to the performers in this piece. Is that something you do with a lot of your music, or is it specific to this piece because it is for the kinds of musicians who are used to doing more of that? Um, it it really depends on it depends on the piece. It depends on the context. But I'm I'm really okay with I with performers taking liberties in pieces if it serves a musical purpose yeah i mean i there are lots of very detailed processes that are involved in making these pieces um that i think it's important it's it's important that those processes come across but i think the processes can come across with people taking liberties as well and you know you, you guys were talking about don giovanni before and and verity i mean there are liberties that are taken in a lot of those arias when a singer does them the sort of alternate little phrases and different vocal flourishes that I think are just fine. I mean, I think we get really caught up that this has to be precisely the same way each time. Well, part of the excitement about live performance is for there to be that element of, of, of newness. 
Right. And I, I agree with that, but we've, we've talked to a lot of composers who don't feel that way. And, and in fact, interestingly, I think a lot of performers who don't feel that way as well. Um, it's important that your notation reflects that, Frank? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I work very closely with most of the people who play my music. I mean, what's, what's interesting with the LA Electric Aid is I didn't work closely with them at all. They kind of just took this and ran with it. Um, the pitches and the rhythms are usually all extremely precise. Um, you know, there, there are, it really depends on certain pieces. You know, I'm thinking about the new cycle. The new song cycle I just wrote has some indeterminate elements. I mean, there's one movement that literally needs to be, it's, it's a series, the piano part is a series of 19 chords that are printed on card stock and they have to be shuffled before each performance. The order will never be the same twice. So, interesting. you know, <laughs> I, you know I, I like playing with ideas, with indeterminate ideas, usually ones that, that have very perceptible musical ends. I don't really, for me, find it interesting to create things that you don't wind up being able to hear if you're paying right. close attention to things. Um, but yeah, I like, I like that element of newness. I don't want to over notate a piece to death to the point where I'm like not only determining what notes and what rhythms you're playing, but I'm determining how you feel and what you bring to it. I mean, I guess this is another extension of what we were talking about earlier about my discomfort of wanting to impose my viewpoint mm. on other people. I mean, I really do think players need to make this music their own. And I think the music that we talk about that, you know, Mozart, Vivaldi, you know, Verdi, whoever else we brought up in today, you know, that music has resonance with people to this day, hundreds of years later, because interpreters are able to feel like they can make it their own. And um, yeah, that's not, not to say that's exactly the spelled only, out. Yeah, I mean that's not. I mean that's not to say that there isn't a lot of amazing music that's very, very precise that I truly love as a listener. But for what I would want to do as a composer, I would like it to be somewhat more open ended. All right. Well, I think we should probably leave it there uh, for this week. Frank, thank you so much for joining us. It has been a delight talking to you for the last hour or so. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, we're, tell us uh, if you have any any uh, big things coming up that you want to plug. Let us know where we can find your stuff. Oh, big things coming up. Well, I mean, the premiere of this, um, you know, Philip Chia and pianist Trudy Chan will be doing um, the, the new song cycle, Versions of the Truth, the Stephen Crane cycle, at Tenry Cultural Institute. So everybody from all over the world can come to New York City on February 23rd and, and fill up Tenry. You know, I wonder you know, how concert promotion on the web is kind of weird in that sense. Because I agree. You, um, but that is, you know, that, that is the upcoming thing. They will also be doing uh, the world premiere of the complete performance, believe it or not, 30 years later, actually 31 years later, because it'll be 2013, of The Nurturing River, which is a series of, of 14 songs um, based on poetry of a lifelong friend of mine who was actually my high school math teacher, um, James Murphy, and and then some solo piano pieces of mine. Um, the other thing that I'd like to plug, though, is I, I discovered this quite by accident recently. Um, the Other Minds website has a full video performance. They are streaming my entire opera, or performance oratorio is a, a term I prefer to use for it, based on the life of the founder of Fluxus, George Machunis, which I created with an artist named Lucio Pozzi. So if you type in in Google the misspelled name Machunis, <laughs> we purposely, purposefully... Misspelled phonetically his name. spelled it. Yes, M A C H U N A S. The irony is this was premiered in Lithuania, where Machunas <laughs> was from, and everybody called it with our spelling Macunas, right. so they mispronounced it. Um, Machunas, M A C H U N A S. If you type that into your browser, the first, the first thing you'll thing get is the um, website we created for it. But the second thing you'll get is a full stream of, of the production. I have that. Sam, Sam, I lost you. Lost can't hear you. No, no. I heard I, him. But I'm actually but I, hearing things with echoes. It's yeah. actually a really neat sonic effect, so I wasn't complaining about it. I kinda like <laughs> it, it happens. happens. 
Well, we'll pretend that it wasn't that important. <laughs> Sorry, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can get it fixed for next time. Uh, we'll have links to those and all, all the other things that we talked about today on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. Uh, you can find uh, also all of our past archives. Those are all there, soundnotion.tv slash SN. You can leave a comment. You can get in touch with us that way. Uh, we want to, as we talked about earlier, we want to be uh, a platform. We want to be a place for people conversation on these topics that we're discussing we don't want our opinions that we shared in this last hour to um to be the only ones that that are that are available so uh please stop by and do that some people were of course doing that as always in our chat room live so thank you to everybody who watched us live you can do that every sunday at 11 a.m eastern time soundnotion.tv slash live so uh thank you to everyone who did that this week um, people ask us sometimes how they can support what we do. Uh, we, you'll, you'll see that we don't have ads, and that's not really that we're not soliciting them, it's that we don't really uh, have any. Um, but if you'd like to support what we're doing, uh, you can go to our site uh, and look at the Amazon uh, search box on the right hand side. And if you use that to buy the next thing that you buy from Amazon, doesn't matter what it is, could be the music that we talked about could be um legos for christmas gift or something uh and that will give us just a tiny commission we really appreciate that people have been doing that for a couple weeks and it's been really helpful um so thank you to everyone who has done that and we would encourage everyone uh who who hasn't to to give it a shot again it doesn't cost you anything it's just we get a tiny little commission for that um this show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store, so be sure to go there and subscribe for free and catch every episode. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lapp. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you back next week. Malarkey. <laughs>